Well, welcome everyone to the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors webinar series on online education and open education resources. My name is John Slater. I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Southern New Hampshire University, and I am the moderator for this webinar series. I just want to go through a few guidelines for everyone. Um, Number one is if you could call using your computer, that would be best as um, the NCSE will not be charged in that case. Uh, everybody besides the presenter and the moderator should be muted. And when you submit questions or you'd like to submit a question, please use the WebEx chat box and address everyone. What I will do is I will um, moderate the uh, questions and I will uh, combine some possibly and at the end of the presentation I will uh, speak the questions to our presenter and then he will respond. And please note that the webinar is being recorded. I want to start off with just some basic terminology. Uh, throughout this web webinar series, we'll be dealing with uh, some industry uh, standards, and I just wanted to get everyone up to speed to those. First of all, we may hear some presenters refer to the LMS, which means the uh, Learning Management System, and obvious um, examples of those are Blackboard, Moodle, and WebCT is another one. We'll also hear the term possibly fully online, which is uh, 80% or greater of content delivered online, and we'll also be referring interchangeably to programs and courses online. Hybrid, sometimes referred to as blended, being 30 to 79% of content delivered online, and again, programs and courses. And then a relatively new term, uh, MOCs, or massively open online courses. So. One of the impetus for uh, the NCSC wanting to put together this webinar series is the fact that online enrollment is growing substantially. From 2001 to 2011, there was an order of magnitude um, growth in enrollment. During that time, comparatively, in higher ed in general, uh, post-secondary uh, degree-granting institutions, it was about a 60% increase in enrollment, so substantially more students going online, if you will. And uh, projections for the next five years or so um, were done by a company, a consulting firm, Edu Adventures in Boston, and here's a chart that they put together, and they're projecting the growth to slow down a little bit in the next uh, few years into double, or from double-digit growth in, in the past six to eight years to single-digit growth. And because of our audience, um, I put together this slide just to give you a little bit on uh, environmental programs that are offered fully online. And so I did a little bit of uh, research on, in that area, and I found that there are some science, environmental science, environmental studies, environmental sustainability, and environmental management degrees that are offered fully online. And my search resulted in um, looking at who was offering those degrees, and what I found was that about seven public nonprofit organizations, private nonprofit, I found two programs, and for profit, there's about six programs. That was in 2011. One of the questions that I had with uh, looking at environmental science studies, sustainability programs online, is that how are labs handled? And some of the programs do use virtual labs, while others require face-to-face -face laboratories. And one of those is uh, Oregon State University that offers an environmental science degree online. And notably, the first uh, sustainability mock was offered in uh, August of 2012 at the University of Illinois. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, happy to introduce today's presenter, 
uh, Wayne McIntosh, who's the founding director of Open Education Resource Foundation and the Commonwealth of Learning Chair in OER. So it's up to you, Wayne. Yeah, good, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Kia ora, greetings uh, from New Zealand. Let's um, pass the ball here. I'm just um, uploading my desktop to share. There we go. Good morning from the deep south of the South Island in New Zealand. Uh, by virtue of our geography, we're in the very fortunate position to see the future that's already happened, at least from your perspective. And uh, it's a beautiful spring morning here. Uh, this Friday morning, and um, you know, I can assure you that uh, your Friday is going to be just fine uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you, and uh, I'd like to share with you um, what we are doing uh, with the Open Education Resource University Initiative. It's uh, a bold innovation partnership which aims to provide free learning opportunities for all students worldwide with uh, opportunities to acquire formal uh, university degrees. I usually uh, start off with a health warning, and um, that is if you do suffer from hypertension, it's best that you listen to me under parental guidance. And uh, the reason for that being is I am a free software user. And if during the course of today's presentation I don't get to mention your favorite proprietary software tool, uh, just take a deep breath, you, you'll be just fine. Uh, the reason is, is if, if you ask me, you know, when that, that there is a wonderful piece of software you're using, can I get a copy? I don't want to be faced with the ethical dilemma of refusing to help a friend in order to uphold the copyright provisions of the software. A little bit about the Open Education Resource Foundation. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit entity uh, that provides leadership, uh, international networking, and support to education institutions around the world to achieve their strategic objectives through the use of open education approaches. The definition of uh, OERs that uh, I rather like is the, the one that Stephen Downs uh, has coined. And open education resources are simply materials that are used to support education that uh, can be freely accessed, reused, and modified and shared by anyone uh, without restriction. At the OER Foundation, we uh, administer two flagship initiatives. Uh, the, the one is uh, the Wiki Educator Project. Uh, this is a global collaboration of more than 40,000 educators, largely from the formal education sector, working at the heart of the education endeavor, and that is to share knowledge freely using open education resources. Our other flagship initiative is the OER Tertiary Education Network which is the driving force behind the implementation of the OER University. Uh, to date, we have uh, 20 contributing members from, uh, from five continents uh, and with a substantive foothold in, in, in 20 countries. And, and so in the near future, our, our network will be able to provide formal academic credit for free learning uh, as indicated on five continents. Of particular interest to yourselves based in the United States of America, our three founding anchor partners um, from the United States, of course, Southern New Hampshire University, uh, who's convening uh, this webinar series, uh, Empire State College, which as you know is part of the State University of New York system, and Thomas Edison uh, State College, uh, a little further north from you, our uh, Canadian partners uh, at the Basque University, uh, who are Canada's premier online teaching university, uh, Thompson Rivers University in British Columbia, and uh, a BC campus. 
when thinking about OER, I mean, one of the key questions, particularly if um, open education resource projects are add-ons to mainstream operations within the organization, uh, the question arises, you know, how, how do we sustain OER projects? Uh, but to be quite honest, I think that's the wrong question, uh, because if we do mainstream open education approaches, I think the question really is, is how will your institutions remain sustainable without OER? And um, let me illustrate this with a practical example. Uh, in the United States of America today, uh, the average cost for a four-year degree uh, in the public uh, university sector is roughly about 26,000 uh, US dollars. And uh, these figures are from 2008, so they're a little outdated. Um, here in New Zealand, um, and an example for a four-year degree at Otago Polytechnic would be roughly you know, just short of 20,000 uh, US dollars. Under the OER University collaboration, and we've just launched our first prototype course, and at current pricing levels before, we've had the opportunity of achieving economies of scale with the model. The comparable cost of a full four-year degree would be just short of $7,000. And as the Vice Chancellor of the University of South Southern Queensland has indicated, we have succeeded in removing cost as a barrier to learning. But first and foremost, I do want to stress that our project is a philanthropic initiative, uh, but it is smart philanthropy uh, because the contributions that our institutions make through the community service mission uh, and the experiences gained through that, in, uh, through the participation in the OER University, can be plowed back to improving efficiencies on campus. You'll all be familiar with the tragedy of the village green in medieval Europe, uh, which was, of course, overgrazed. And my good friend, Professor Rory McGrill, the UNESCO cold chair for OER, alerted me to this protest poem round about those times. They hang the man and flog the woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leave the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the the goose, and to some extent, I think we in tertiary education have been a little guilty of stealing the common off the goose, and if, if we at the OER Foundation have seen anything into the future of sustainable education, it's only because we stand on the shoulders of giants, and that is a line I stole from a speech given by Eben Moglen in 2001, who stole that line from Isaac Newton, who stole that line from Louis Steathis. And we know this because the American sociologist Bernard Schauters had referenced an anonymous note uh, posted in the British Journal. Thinking about disruptions in education, uh, you may well remember Kodachrome, which was, of course, a world market leader in the sale, in the production and sale of color film photography. In 2009, Kodachrome ceased operations. Um, but the interesting thing with this example is that the fundamentals of photography have remained the same, but the way we do business has, has changed. But the example I particularly like, which is perhaps a little closer to home, uh, so to speak, is the ice harvesting industry. In uh, the late 1800s, uh, the ice harvesting industry was within the top three earners of gross domestic product in the U.S., and um, we know the history, the invention of compressor-driven refrigeration. And as a result, I have no members of my family working in the ice harvesting industry. But what is interesting about this example is the rhetoric that we often hear around the times of these, these disruptions. There were those arguing that the quality of the cold from authentic ice was superior to the quality of the cold from artificial ice. And similarly, in the open education space, we have a number of red herrings as well, most notably that uh, the sky is going to fall down, that you know, if we open up our courses using 
OERs uh, that we are going to lose student enrollments. Um, in fact, there is no research evidence uh, which suggests that this is going to happen. Uh, the other red herring is, of course, that OERs are poor quality. And um, I put it to you, if we as educators are the ones who are developing these open education resources for sharing, who are we going to blame for poor quality? A little about the concept of the OER University. Uh, we are building an international network which is going to provide free learning opportunities for all students worldwide. And we are going to do this, and what enables us to do this is we are developing courses which are based entirely on open education resources. Um, it is indeed possible uh, to develop a scalable and sustainable system of academic volunteers to support learners through their free learning experiences. At this point, uh, our anchor partners as part of this network will be providing assessment services leading to full credentials on a fee-for-service basis. But a little, uh, a few thoughts about uh, the numbers behind this um, in terms of you know, what are the economic drivers and, you know, why is the system sustainable? Uh, researchers at uh, UNESCO uh, and the Commonwealth of Learning conservatively predict that over the next 25 years globally, we need to provide for an additional 100 million places. Now, you can do the mental math around that. Um, this means creating the equivalent of four sizable institutions of 30,000 students each every week for the next 25 years. Uh, we know that the conventional delivery model is not going to be able to respond to this demand for tertiary education. So what about the business model? And then how much is this going to cost and you know who, who's going to pay? Well, there are two drivers which will ensure sustainability. The first is that the marginal cost of replicating digital knowledge or digital online courses is near zero. And the second driver, of course, which is not rocket science, if 10 institutions work together and collaborate on developing high quality courses, it's far cheaper than doing it alone. So what have we got so far in building this OER university? We have literally thousands of courses which have been published uh, as open courseware. There are thousands of open access journals. There's a growing inventory of OERs, and our knowledge is increasing around open education practices. We have more than 70 years organizational experience in providing learning at a distance. And the majority of our institutions already have existing policies in place for uh, recognition of prior learning. And so it is indeed plausible that we can build this university. And late in 2010, uh, Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor from the University of Southern Queensland and myself were speaking at the same conference. and. Uh, Clearly, our ideas were well aligned, and uh, you know, I said to Jim, well, this is the OER university concept we're trying to build, and we agreed to call a meeting, an open meeting, and with funding support from UNESCO, we were able to stream this meeting live on the internet to discuss the concept and logic model for an OER university. We had well over 200 participants from this short of 50 countries around the world uh, helping us think through the design of the OERU. In short, the, the concept uh, looks something like this. We, there are a number of services which we can share and, and work together and provide for free. Uh, services like open curriculum, open design and development of courses, open student support. On the other hand, there are a number of services which individual education institutions are best uh, positioned to provide on a fee-for-service basis. 
uh, things like open assessment and open credentialing services. Of course, we can share an open infrastructure based on the use of free and open source software. But above all, we are building the network on the solid foundation of quality. Um, there will be parity of esteem between credentials earned through the OER University network and the uh, full-time full campus counterparts. The next step, of course, was to recruit our founding anchor partners, and uh, by November that year, we hosted the inaugural meeting of founding anchor partners, and the key decisions which we took at that meeting was to uh, decide on our inaugural credential, which will be a Bachelor of General Studies, uh, to commence the development uh, of our prototype courses, of which uh, the first one has now been completed and will be uh, running for students uh, at the end of this month. And we are targeting the formal international launch of the OERU which in 2013, which will be on the 8th of November uh, at Thompson Rivers University. So what are the rules of the game? How does this work? Our anchor partners uh, agree to credential learners who acquired their learning through the use of OERs on a cost recovery basis. Each of our anchor partners contributes towards the assembly of two courses based in entirely on OERs. And within the network, we aim to maximize credit transfer among the OERU partners to ensure efficiency of the model. And of course, each of our anchor partners are either gold or silver members of the nonprofit OER Foundation. And it is that revenue stream which provides the infrastructure for the network to be able to function. So, you know, a brief summary of, you know, how this all works. Um, the OER University does not confer degrees. Uh, it is our anchor partners who confer the credentials. Our anchor partners retain full decision-making autonomy over aspects like the price they are going to charge for assessment services, uh, the local matriculation requirements. Of course, some institutions require that you complete a higher percentage of credits at that institution rather than transferring in. Uh, so we are not requiring any of our partners to change the local matriculation requirements. And um, we have the, uh, a key feature of the model is that none of our anchor partners are required to change existing policy because um, most of our institutions have the necessary policy mechanisms in place in order for the model to function. It seems my system is uh, hanging at the moment, but I've uh, basically come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I can assure you that we are going to be providing free learning opportunities by building a parallel learning universe to serve those learners who are excluded from the formal education sector. And um, at this point, you know, thank you very much for your attention. And I, I look forward to um, sharing a few thoughts and ideas with you. Well, thank you, Wayne. Um, we uh, have a question that I was hoping you could address from uh, one of our listeners. And it talks about uh, content versus uh, teaching, perhaps. And the question is such that um, it, as you can see probably in the box, Content is, in practice, the cheap part of education. Expensive part is the assistance and guidance from teachers in navigating content. OER um, seems to place it within the open pedagogy and open student support. Can you address the economics of these two areas? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's a very good question. Um, before I get into the specifics of responding to that question, I, I just want to take a step back in reflecting in more general terms about um, successful innovation. And certainly within higher education, I think one of the most important aspects to think about is to make sure that with any new innovation, that the innovations um, 
must be accepted by the economy and society. In other words, we shouldn't innovate beyond the capacity of society to accept those innovations. And this, the concept of an examination-only model is certainly not new. Um, the University of London in the United Kingdom 150 years ago uh, uh, conceived the External Studies Initiative, which basically said, we don't care where you acquire your learning, but if you can pass the University of London degree, uh, you will earn your credential from us. And that initiative has produced five Nobel laureates. And so the, the concept of providing uh, open education resources for free for students worldwide and then uh, providing formal assessment services on top of that is certainly not new in any way. And we have you know, good examples of this having been done in the past. So under the o, uh, OER university model, our member partners will not be providing any tutorial support services for these learners, and obviously because this carries cost. Um, but what we are doing is uh, using the affordances of the internet and the open web uh, to provide reasonably high levels of student content interactions, uh, as well as designing scalable systems of peer learning support. Now, I mean, if you think of this at scale, uh, with, with you know with a cohort of you know two or three thousand learners studying you know a particular course, the likelihood of you know two or three students actually knowing the answer to the question is is reasonably high. Um, and, and and so using technologies, we we make use of um, a peer-based question and answer forum where you know students can answer, ask questions. Uh, academic volunteers and other students can provide answers and there's a bit of game theory involved here that uh, participants in this community forum earn kudos uh, you know by posting good questions and providing good answers you know over time and uh, you know I, I, I do agree um, the, the value of you know interactions with with tutors are extremely valuable uh, but the majority of the world doesn't have the money to pay for that. Um, and, and, and so the, the learners we are aiming to support are the learners who are excluded from the system and to provide access to more affordable uh, education opportunities. Um, you know, any student worldwide who wants to purchase a full tutorial package and, 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 and get that, those high levels of you know, interaction and support from a community of scholars that are actively engaged in research will still be free to do so. Um, we are not aiming to replace or, or compete with that model. Our vision is to build a, a parallel uh, universe to serve those learners who are excluded from the system. Well, thank you, Wayne. Um, we have another question, and it pertains to uh, the role that for-profit organizations might play in OER. And the question, um, is what role do you think? Do you think for-profit organizations will be part of this, uh, some of the services that are provided by, um, will, will be one of the institutions that provide some of the services that you speak of for OER? Oh, uh, ab absolutely. I mean, um, you know, if, if we look at the global demand and the challenges we, we need to address, uh, the for-profit sector is certainly going to be pl playing a role here. And um, you know, I think we are going to see considerable diversification in the provision of higher education worldwide. Um, you know, speaking from the non-profit sector, um, I mean, that's not the game we are in. Uh, uh, what we are doing is helping uh, largely publicly funded uh, education institutions in widening their participation in the open education model. Uh, from a non-profit perspective, and you know how our model works is, you know, any surplus revenue that we generate, we actually reinvest back into the development of OER courses for the benefits, you know, of all, all our members and anybody who actually wants to use those materials. Uh, but I do think we are going to see diversification. You know, as as I said right in the beginning, uh, we are a philanthropic initiative, um, and you know, it's smart philanthropy. We actually want to help our member institutions uh, slowly 
integrate uh, open education practices within the organizations for you know, in, in the beginning strategic projects, but hopefully that will improve over time uh, so that we can really raise uh, the efficiency of the post-secondary system. I mean, we, we're all aware of the fundamental challenges we, we face in the public university system. Uh, in most of the OECD countries around the world over the last decade, the cost of tuition to our students has been in increasing in excess of the inflation index. And, um, you know, that, that's just not a sustainable model. We've really got to get a lot smarter in terms of, you know, what we're doing. Um, thank you, Wayne. Uh, a question that I had uh, pertains to that. Now, we've all seen recently in the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed articles such as uh, higher education needs fixing and things like and titles along those lines. And I have heard of some initiatives where universities are going to diverge from the traditional model and perhaps hire faculty simply to teach, hire someone else to do the assessment, and so on and so forth. And it really sounds like a model that, that is similar to OER. And, and so my question would be, do you have any visions that once OER gets running and perhaps the efficiency is um, recognized that universities or college may jump on and um, try to duplicate the model at a local or perhaps a, a, a regional institution. Okay, um, you know, a couple of thoughts and reflections there. Um, where we are coming from strategically, as I pointed out, our, our mission is not to uh, contribute to undermining uh, university practice. Uh, this is not what we're about, on, on the contrary. Uh, the work that we're doing is to actually help uh, sustain uh, you know the, the 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 traditional model, if you know, so to speak. Um, there's, uh, I mean, the university as institution is one of only a handful of organisations that survived the industrial revolution, and I, I'm confident that universities will survive the knowledge revolution as well, because it's something very unique that universities, uh, you know, provide for society, and that is the ability to interact and uh, engage with the community of scholars who are, are engaged in uh, research and the production of knowledge. And there, there is no organization which, rep, you know, can replicate that. And for that reason, I believe, you know, post-secondary education will provide that point of difference. But you're absolutely right. You uh, are seeing a number of uh, universities and uh, a number of elite universities, in fact, worldwide, who are joining commercial operations, uh, supposedly using open models. I mean, the example which immediately springs to mind is Coursera, of course, uh, which is providing uh, free learning. Uh, but I must point out that those resources are not open education resources. Uh, institutions do not have the rights to adapt and modify and reuse those materials um, for their own purposes. Um, the other point of difference between what initiatives like Coursera and edX, the, you know, the collaboration with MIT, Harvard, and, and, and Berkeley uh, are doing is that the certification that learners are receiving is on, are not real degrees. Um, they, you know, they're certificates of accomplishment. Uh, I mean, a, a learner participating in edX is not going to get an MIT degree. Uh, whereas what we are doing as the OER University Network, our learners are getting credible credentials. Um, it's just that the open model is far more effective in achieving that. And you know, from the perspective of the OER Foundation as a non-profit, uh, you know, we would love to see you know, local colleges and universities, you know, integrating OER into the, into the model and, in fact, using our materials to achieve that uh, because our strategic mission in life is to promote the mainstream adoption of OERs on all campuses worldwide uh, because we will just have a far more efficient system. I mean, there are a number of challenges. This might not be so true of the United States of America, but certainly in, in, in most parts of the, the Commonwealth, uh, the former British uh, colonies, uh, the majority of post-secondary education is funded through taxpayer revenue. And so there are all these issues around, well, um, you know, is it appropriate for taxpayers 
to pay uh, to have to pay twice for the education because you know the development of course materials has in fact already been funded by taxpayer dollars by virtue of the salaries of academics. Now I do realize there are difference, differences in higher education systems worldwide with reference to the proportion of funding which comes from you know, taxpayer revenue to support post-secondary education but we would welcome uh, you know rapid and well rapid growth in institutions adopt, adopting OERs and if anybody wants help in doing that we, we're happy to assist you and um, you know why our system works is because uh, there are a number of things that you need for this model to function and it's it's only a network that can you know deliver on on, you know, on those needs I mean for example um, if you were trying to do this as a single institution, uh, um, you wouldn't be able, or the, the cost of replicating the infrastructure to run large courses would be astronomical. Uh, whereas uh, within a network model, uh, we are able to share those costs, uh, you know, across the network. So it's just uh, a, a, a far more efficient system, not not unlike the uh, competition model we find in the business sector where organizations agree to collaborate uh, in order that they can compete better. Um, the, I mean, the point is, uh, as you know, scientists uh, with a keen interest in sustainability, um, OER is a sustainable and renewable resource. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, we are going to succeed. Great. Well, that's all the questions that we have right now from the audience. Um, Oh, actually, we just got another one in. Can I, can I, if, if you uh, could address one more? Uh, can you speak about the demographics of OER use, students, location, age, etc., and how that could be different from traditional universities and colleges? Uh, yeah, I'm, the, the, the dem demographics are widespread. Um, we, we are literally uh, worldwide, uh, international. And uh, the average uh, age uh, of our cohort of the learners that are working with us is more than half of our participants are over the age of 45. So it, it is a, a more senior um, demographic that we are addressing. And, and it makes sense. I mean, remember, we, we're helping learners who, for whatever reason, have not been able to acquire a, you know, a formal tertiary education. And, and, and so our age is a lot higher. I mean, I don't see our model uh, in any way replacing, you know, the traditional school leaver uh, who starts the, you know, the first degree uh, at, a, you know, at a traditional university. Um, because as we know, uh, you know, we, we, we join institutions for a whole range of reasons uh, other than, you know, merely acquiring a credential. Um, so, I mean, I don't think our model is going to have any impact on that traditional market at all. But certainly, um, you know, with, with learners wanting to reskill or, you know, learners who have been exclu excluded from the system, uh, we, uh, we are provi providing a, a, you know, a far more affordable pathway to earning, you know, credible degrees. Great, thank you. Uh, OER seems to have some similarities to the Open University in the UK. Is there a relationship there? Well, um, the relationship will be in uh, the, the, the methods of, of, of design of, of courses. In other words, that we are designing courses for independent study. Uh, the difference between the model, uh, between the British Open University model and what we are doing is that our courses are based entirely on open education resources. So we are able to achieve, um, you know, e economies of scale uh, at far lower thresholds than is possible with the open university model. Um, and, um, and that's, you know, just uh, because of, of history. Um, the big mega universities of the world, like the British Open University, which were conceived during the peak of the industrial e era, uh, there was considerable setup cost uh, in, in order to design and develop these, you know, high quality materials and, and then reproduce them and distribute them. And one needed, you know, very large cohorts in order to make that model sustainable. But as I, you know, pointed out earlier, the affordances of the web is uh, the barriers to, you know, entry are far lower today than, than you know, what you know what they are under the traditional development model of the British Open University. 
um, and we've done the, the costing calculations. Uh, the effective cost, uh, you know, including membership, the staff time that an individual institution contributes for the two university courses and the amortization of programs, roughly for an investment of, you know, seven uh, and a half thousand dollars at our current membership levels, the return on investment is a network value per annum of over a half a million dollars. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. You know, you put in seven and a half, or, you know, seven and a half K, and you get network value back into your institution of half a million dollars. There are very few business models that can compete with that. Great. Well, that's all the questions, looks like, we have today. Um, we thank you again, Wayne, for your time and effort, and we really look forward to hearing more about OER as it develops. And it's an exciting project and exciting uh, initiatives there. Sure. Thank you very much. And um, I, I would like to give you all and to all the staff at all your institutions um, the gift of knowledge, a, a free gift. We, we are running a, a free uh, online workshop series on OERs, copyright, and Creative Commons licenses, which is, will start on the 3rd of uh, December. And uh, if any of your staff at any of your institutions are, are interested in learning more about this, uh, you're most welcome um, to, to come and join us. It's entirely free. And um, you know, if you just go to the homepage of wikieducator.org, uh, you'll, you'll be able to find the links to, to register. And um, of course, um, if anybody's interested in joining our network, um, you're more than welcome to do so. Great. Thanks again. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. And hopefully, you can come back next week and uh, join us again. Thanks again, Wayne. And we're See you later. Take care.